Okay, we are with Max Hillebrand, and I'm just thrilled to talk to you, Max. I, uh, Nick and I were at a conference in Bedford. It was Peter McCormick's Cheat Code Conference. You were on the stage, and you said something that I want to dive into. You were discussing about you were discussing the hidden cost of inflation. I think it was in that moment I immediately concluded you were a very smart person. Max, the way you were describing it uh, was just so clear. I I really kind of enjoyed it. And then we were fortunate enough to bump into you at the football game the next day. And uh, I'm just going to say this publicly now, Max. This is where I was standing next to Max. And Max was articulating things about Austrian economics and books he had read. And I just turned to him and I said, you piss me off. And the reason I said you piss me off is because this is a smart dude. And I was envious of how intelligent he was. And uh, I was in between Nick and Jeff Booth and Max there thinking, who are these people? So it was just a really great experience to get to know you better, uh, Max. And uh, I just think this is such an important topic. I, I just want to dive in and then I'm going to ask you some of the books and Austrian versus Keynesian economics and how we should think about that if that's a new concept to some people. Um, but can we start with that? What is like, how do you articulate the hidden cost of inflation? We all know about the prices going up, obviously, but what is the hidden cost of inflation? Yeah, the hidden cost of inflation, uh, it, it, there are numerous of them, right? Uh, if, if only inflation were only the increase of uh, or the loss of purchasing power of the money, right? That that we could somewhat deal with, that we could manage. But but there's there's way more additional things. Um, u- ultimately, with, well, as soon as we increase the money supply, which is the technical definition of inflation, uh, then some people, of course, get that money, right? They and and they are perceived to be wealthier uh, because well, they just have some of that newly created money. And people who are more wealthy than uh, usually go out and spend that money. Uh, and humans can can spend on two things, either on production or on consumption. And either we produce the things that we would like to have in the future, uh, but that takes time and takes capital and, and uh, technologies and labor and all of this. Uh, but the ultimate end goal of production is, of course, to consume something in the future. Uh, so even production will eventually lead to consumption. And if we are wealthier rather than poorer, we would consume and, and produce more than otherwise. Uh, and this this means there, there are two things. First, we over consume, uh, meaning, you know, we, we go on a party and grill a second pig, uh, even though one might have been just fine. You know, we, we really want to make a feast. Uh, and, and so we consume more than than we otherwise would have, which, of course, means now there's a pig missing that that we cannot eat for the next fiesta. Uh, and and uh, on the other side, we have uh, over con- uh, overproduction or, or malinvestments, uh, where we allocate capital in a more roundabout production stages for for goods and services that we might not really need. Right? So we find very complex ways to uh, create something and to alleviate problems where maybe uh, another problem would have been more efficient to solve, or or we could have solved an existing problem with with less other resources. Uh, so inflation or increase of the money supply means we we are uh, mismanaging the economy in two ways. And we consume more than we uh, actually should, and we produce the things that we don't really need. Uh, and and both of these together leads to simply a, a destruction of resources. Uh, we're we're no longer profitable, but but we consume and we decrease our capital stock. Right? We get poorer and poorer and poorer. Uh, and uh, yeah, another downside is that we don't even really notice that we do get poorer and poorer mm-hmm. uh, because in nominal values, all of our portfolios go up. Yeah, right? well, mm-hmm. We all feel rich, but that's, of course, because, uh, well, the most obvious consequence of inflation, the, the value of the money going down. So, yeah, our portfolios in, in number go up, uh, but in actual quality, uh, they tend to go down. Uh, Max, how did you get into this? I mean, w- w- you you describe we talked about it a little, a little briefly when we met, but just for those who don't know you, why are you why have you gone down this rabbit hole? What kind of drew you to this con these topics? I I, I uh, was always trying to be productive and, and helpful to others. You know, I had jobs quite early on in life, and um, also always in in the service industry, uh, and and that made me curious for why do we even work you know why do we need to do this and and is it a good thing or a bad thing you know should i be annoyed or angry that i have to go out to work or is there actually a more positive outlook on on, on this matter yes. <laughs> um, and uh, and then at first i discovered keynesian economics uh, and uh, that leads you to make more of the first conclusion all the work sucks this is horrible um you know we, we should rebel against it um but but then ultimately i found the austrian school of economics uh, which has a much more positive mindset and, and outlook uh, to what it means to be human and and what work and productivity actually means that, that it's a wonderful thing to be an entrepreneur and to, and to help others 
um, while, while being efficient at it, you know, to literally create value uh, and, and to spread it around to many people. It's, it's, uh, it's an insane pleasure and, and privilege to be an entrepreneur and, and to be helpful for others at a scale that not just sustains yourself, but also the people you can employ, etc. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that it, it just gave me a real good appreciation for wh why, you know, productivity and, and uh, entrepreneurship is, is important for, for society. And uh, also then, you know, got me interested in, in monetary uh, theory as well. Now, what is this money thing in the first place and, and why do we use it? And, and uh, why can they print the money? But, but I can't, you know, that always uh, struck me as a bit weird, um, especially then when, you know, I actually got uh, to, to be a, a banker and, um, yeah, just really found out that that even low level bankers have have insane privileges that that average Joes simply do not have. Um, not just can they you know issue debt and therefore increase the money supply at, at infinitum, but but also they can spy on everyone and see exactly what transactions you send and and to whom and for how much, how much you're saving, etc. Uh, so I I yeah was inside the belly of the beast. Uh, and I didn't know I didn't know you were a banker for for whatever reason I had you were in my mind as a professor teaching these <laughs> concepts. I didn't know you were a banker. Uh, yeah, this this was actually in university. Um, and in Germany, there's this very interesting um, dual study program where for three months of the year you go to university, and for three months you work in a business, and then back for three months university and three months work, etc. And and the school and and the work is somewhat synchronized that that you talk about similar projects or similar topics that you then later apply in, in actual work. It's a really fascinating program, and and so I did that for three years at Deutsche Bank, um, while you know being being a uh, not just Austrian Deutsche Bank, honest, Deutsche Bank also, of all banks, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. I'm, I'm telling you, it was a wild time. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know that that just made me even more bullish on on not just the the fundamental beauty of Austrian economics and the the only real economic thought that could explain all the craziness that I saw inside the bank plus all of the craziness that that you know you see in Bitcoin and, and other areas. Um, so Austrian economics just is is extremely useful to to uh, as a theory to help navigate life uh, ultimately. Uh, and and that yeah that, that's that's why I think my my interest in economics has has increased and, and is thriving uh you know even as mm. as i get older yeah when i stumbled into uh you know we stumbled into real estate as a mechanism to kind of outpace the debasement with maybe not articulating mm -hmm. it that way we came to the conclusion that the leverage of rental properties when nick and i my brother and i had bought them in our 20s we thought oh this is interesting the leverage we're able to get by buying these properties it's one first off it's the only way the bank will allow us to do this is yeah. if we use real estate to get the leverage they seem to be willing to give us the these plebs here you know in in, in canada here you go here's some some leverage for you and that was able to for us we thought outpace some of the debasement that we saw going on and i remember driving to work and i could never understand why i was driving to work anymore because i thought oh my gosh like this leverage i'm getting from the real estate seems to the, the returns i'm getting seem to be outpacing what i'm getting from my nine to five income that i'm driving to every day in traffic and the economics of just that didn't didn't make sense and to make matters worse the highway going to our where our rental properties were was in the direct opposite direction of the bumper to bumper traffic i was stuck in to go to work so literally physically i had this representation of like just going the wrong way being stuck in traffic but it was kind of when i so I kind of understood some of these concepts, but I only kind of started reading about Austrian economics a little bit because of Bitcoin, you know, stumbled into Bitcoin. And then I thought, why is this thing changing my mindset? Why is this giving me such optimism about the future? Um, when you say Austrian economics gives you kind of hope or optimism or makes you feel good versus Keynesian econo uh, economics, which had the opposite effect, what is it specifically that comes to mind? Like, what is it about these two schools of thought that where one gives you this framework that could be, you know, of, of happiness and maybe joy and like there's a hope for your future versus the other that seems a little bit more dark to me? Well, I, I guess um, mental clarity and correctness, uh, you know, logical correctness uh, might might be uh, something like Kings in economics just sounds like gobbledygook. It, it, it's, it's really fancy words, really incredible models uh, and, and, and quite complex. And the math, uh, you know, math checks out and is, and is beautiful in the end. But but you're not really quite sure of, of why you're 
why are you calculating this model? Um, you're, you're just dealing with with abstracts and and uh, aggregates of numbers, and and the closest thing you get to humanity is you know the Homo economicus, which is basically Superman. You know, doesn't make any mistakes, knows exactly what he wants, when he wants it, um, and never makes a bad investment, etc. Um, just stuff that doesn't really feel real. You know, it doesn't feel human. It doesn't feel applicable. Um, yeah, but, theoretical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but then Austrian economics is just so is it so simple? So what are some, Max? What are some of the concepts for someone that's trying to understand? Like, okay, what is it that it's simple? Can you just outline some yeah. of maybe the core concepts of Austrian economics? Uh, so like, let's start with the starting point, right? And and that, as Ludwig von Mises put it, is human action, right? So humans are in a state of uneasiness; they have problems, uh, and now they can allocate their scarce resources uh, in order to, on, on on a mission to remove that un uneasiness. Right, but there's uncertainty whether or not the things that you do right now to solve your problem will actually solve that problem in the long run. And right, so there's this entrepreneurial speculation where, um, you, you know, you, you know that you're hungry, but you're not really sure if, if, if you would prefer a steak or, or a banana. Right? There's like um, and, and maybe, yeah, OK, let's let's eat the steak. That, that's going to be nice. But potentially afterwards, you're like, ah, maybe something sweet would have would have been better. And so th there's there's this this constant pressure of we 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 could do even better than we currently are, right? uh, together with uh, if if we play our cards right we'll, we'll be a, a lot better right we we, we can really um, be be productive and uh, allocate our resources in such a way that we do solve all the problems that we have, uh, or we can fail right and and misallocate our resources and work towards something that ultimately was not really the thing that that brought us the most satisfaction. Uh, um, so those are, are are the basics of economics, and the cool thing is, you know, this is just you. Um, economics starts with with the individual. Uh, it's it's not about you know nation states and 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 continents of of very complex productivity. No, it's it's just you, you know, being hungry and and thirsty and and wanting to have shelter. Uh, that already is is beautifully explained with with praxeology, with with the logic of human action. Uh, but it doesn't stop there, right? We can uh, we can make. Uh, a lot of deductions then further into people interacting with each other right you're you're no longer just by yourself but but there's others and the cool thing is we can for example have a division of labor right uh, you're a really great real estate guy and you know i'm uh, let's say the the economist so it's better for you to you know figure out uh, where we're going to sleep tonight and i will I, I, yeah, I don't know, write a book or something. <laughs> um, but if if we each focus on the things that we are marginally best at, uh, you know, the, the thing that we're really, really good at, better than anything else that you personally could do, and, and you focus on this, uh, your task, and, and I do the same for me, you know, find out what I'm marginally best at and, and put my full attention and focus to that. And if afterwards we, we trade, you know, and, and we exchange, we're both better off. Uh, th that's how value multiplication happens, right? When when two or more people can collaborate together, each doing what he is best at, and, and later then trading with each other, you know, exchanging one good for another, in a way that that with each trade we're actually better off than before. You know, I have steak, you have banana. I prefer bananas, you prefer the steak. Uh, right now we're both pretty sad because we don't have the thing that we actually would like the most. But after we trade, we're both better off. Uh, so both of us move, move from a well, bad mood to, to a much better mood where, where we're happy. And that's that's great. That's that's what free trade enables us, you know, to continuously uh, help each other solve not just our own problems, but also those of others. And in that extent, continue increasing the amount of value that, that we have provided, the amount of capital that we have, uh, capital being the thing that we can use to solve even more problems in the future. And so when, when we help each other uh, and, and act productively and, and positively, then not just do we solve our problems today, we, we even give ourselves a head start for the problems that are yet to come in the future. And, and that is different than Keynesian. So the basis of that is that human action is the basis of the economy or econ economics. And it, please correct me if I'm summarizing incorrectly. Um, human action is the basis of it. What I value and what you value and you know what I do is the basis of an economy operating. Whereas in Keynesian economics, I'm just trying to quickly summarize it for myself, for my own understanding. And I, and I, I would guess it's that what, that it's the government, like a, like a, this government money mechanism of, of taxation that tries to drive the flow of the economy. How, how does that? Yeah. How would you summarize it? Um, 
Yeah, so definitely in the, in the Keynesian realm, uh, the government being there to fix a problem uh, is, is very prevalent, right? Some of the, the every conclusion of, of Keynesians is that, yes, we need, you know, big government to step in and, and fix a problem that was created by by other people in, in order to ensure that that we will, you know, all have, have a good outcome. Um, and and why is, is that always the case, right? Why why does some economic school of thought always lead to government intervention ultimately? Um, and, and I guess it's it's because of a, a very foundational, fundamental disagreement, right? Like um, you know the the axiom, uh, e even the thought that economic thought should have an axiom, you know, a logical starting point, is something that is very novel and very unique to Austrian economics. Uh, most previous economic science uh, simply disagreed with that point. It was like, no, no, there are no economic laws. We we can't just look at history and see what happened in the past, and then maybe we can extrapolate some things in the future. Uh, but but there is no fundamental truths to be discovered about economics. Uh, so just by the methodological approach on how to think about economic problems, uh, th these two different schools of thought disagree fun fundamentally. Um, and, you know, and, and one maybe more more tangible effect is uh, what is value? You know, that's one of the many good questions that you should ask as as an economist. Like, why do we value some things? Like, what what is this? Um, and there are multiple different schools of thought but but one for example is the labor theory of value right something is valuable because humans spent a lot of effort in creating this it makes seem, seems to make a lot of sense right like uh sure if if you build you know i don't know a, a wooden table with perfect craftsmanship and nice decoration uh this took a lot of time and and therefore it probably has been valuable right and it's more valuable than something that you know you you do in a couple seconds like I don't know, paper airplane or something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, one is much more massive and, and and substantial because someone put a lot more effort into it. Um, and you know, this seems to be a reasonable argument for what is value and why are things more valuable than others. But it kind of falls flat on the face because uh, you know why, uh, for example, are, are are diamonds so expensive but uh, uh, bread is so cheap? Right? Like um, you know, things that we really really need a lot. Why? Why are they so cheap, meaning not that valuable, and, and things that we rarely need, like diamonds, why are they so valuable? Why are they so expensive? Um, and, and I guess the, the insight that, that is missing from a naive theory like the labor theory of value is that value is not just a, a, a well an objective thing that, that can be observed you know, by, by third parties. Uh, it's, it's not just, oh, I, someone saw that you put 10 hours of work into something and therefore this value is, is this much, no. Um, value is something much more interactive. Value uh, arises, uh, you know, between well, two individuals ultimately. Right? Uh, there, there is not just the the supply side of of how much effort and capital did you have to invest into creating this product, but there's also a demand side for it. And right? like, does anyone actually value the thing that that you're producing? Because you could be, you know, in in the forest with a shovel digging a, a ditch for ten hours, and <laughs> and later filling it again, and you know, making it flat for another five hours, and and voila, you've had fifteen hours of effort. But there's there's no change to the environment, right? Uh, so nobody will will pay you uh, in order to to make this happen, right? There 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 was no value generated. Uh, because yes, you you did provide a lot of effort, but no, it wasn't something that other people's valued. Uh, so for Carl Menger, the pr precursor to uh, Ludwig von Mises, had this genius insight that value is subjective, and then it is marginal, um, it, and it, it, meaning that it doesn't depend on how much you put, how much effort you put into something. But value is much more about the 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 relationship of two people exchanging uh, and you know at, at which value or at, at which price do you value a thing more than the alternative and so uh, uh, value is intrinsic uh, or like to uh, sorry value is not intrinsic but value is uh, in the eye of the beholder so to say uh, and uh, that is one of the many differences quite fundamental differences between Keynesianism or, or communism and um, uh, yeah Praxeology it, or it's funny when you say that because I'm having flashbacks to my aunt in in Croatia at that time. Uh, this was in the 80s. I remember going to a store with her, and the the government had set prices in the store, and there was just a little bit of chocolate, and there was just a little bit of items in this store. And I remember thinking, oh, this is kind of weird because we had this store called Kmart in Canada, which was like just a I don't know, department store, and it seemed like the prices there.
I lost you. I'm not sure if this is just me. I can hear you. Can I can hear you. Can you hear ah, okay. Now, now yeah. you're back. So probably was me. Nope. Like I said, we don't know where you are right now. Max, you could be in a forest somewhere in Europe. We don't know exactly where you are. So we're going <laughs> to Can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Now it's back. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. But just when you were explaining that, I was just explaining that my aunt in Croatia in the 1980s, she was explaining to me, we went into a little store that these prices were set. Whereas in Canada, I remember if there was different seasons of the year, there was different prices because people were valuing things based on the time of year or if there was an event coming up. But when I was going to visit her in Croatia, the price of these things were always set by the government. They were just, these were the prices. And I remember even as a kid thinking that this is a little strange, like, how can the people who are setting these prices understand who is valuing these? And then the store owner, if there can be an owner in a communist country, the store operator at that point, how are they profiting from this? And then what kind of economic signal do they get for what to stock next? They are just told, yeah. have these five pairs of pants, these two batteries, these little bit of chocolate. And like, that was it. So the economic signal coming back from the people, the, the action and the, 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 what the people value in that economy was not being properly reported and represented in the stores. And it produced this economy where you couldn't get what you wanted. Like yeah. we had to bring into that country, we had to bring in Levi's jeans. I'll never forget aspirin and Duracell batteries because they couldn't get Duracell <laughs> batteries. They couldn't get aspirin and they couldn't get Levi's jeans. And this mm -hmm. is the kinds of thing we were brought in because the economic signal was not coming back. So to hear some of these concepts now and then seeing how a communist country operated is very insightful to me personally. What, um, so then the, in, in Keynesian economics, is it, is it not that, is it just, they don't have the concept that people can have a subjective value to things like maybe because my son wants the paper airplane so badly for his birthday, but you spent three years crafting a beautiful wooden table for that moment. Maybe I'm going to value the paper airplane that took you three seconds to, to make versus the wooden table in, in Keynesian economics. Is there just not that concept? Yeah, not, yeah. Um, basically, a lot of topics simply get ignored uh, in, in these other school of thoughts. Uh, it's, it's much more interested about, for example, what are the consequences of, uh, uh, you know, uh, government stimulation in, in the economy and uh, how, how much can the government or how much should the government intervene in certain areas, uh, etc. This it's more, uh, yeah, this is more the, the questions that, that Keynesians um, worry themselves with. But, but here again, I think Mises has a, a beautiful insight, very similar to what you just explained that in, in socialism, uh, calculation is, is not possible, um, meaning economic calculation. You simply do not know if you're profitable or not. You don't know if you're destroying more goods than, than, uh, uh, than, than you create, right? if, uh, if you consume more than, than you produce. Uh, this is impossible for a socialist central planner to ever find out. And why? Because he doesn't have any prices. Uh, because prices uh, fundamentally are created when two individuals consensually meet and consensually exchange their, their goods and services. So you need to have two parties in order to form a price. And right? you by yourself cannot form a price. Again, you could be digging a hole in the middle of the forest and nobody cares. Then there is no price. You need to have someone demanding this good or service and, and actually buying it and, and acquiring it. Uh, only then do, do you get a price. And only with a price can you actually see on are the inputs into my business smaller or greater than, than the outputs or, mm -hmm. or the incoming cash flows, right? Um, it, it, it simply is impossible to find out if you're on the right track or not in a socialist economy. And, and therefore, civilization is not possible. We cannot accumulate capital and wealth on a consistent ma uh, level without prices. And we cannot have prices unless we have property rights and, and free exchange. Hmm. So that's why property rights are so important, because without property rights, we aren't getting the economic signal of what people value. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then when we don't get the signal of what people value, then we cannot build what people value, right? Because we don't know what <laughs> it is. so obvious. <laughs> it, it's so obvious, right? Um, but, oh but then, yeah, we're, we're stuck in, in this miserable state where, where we, we, we could... We can still like anticipate that oh, we, we could do a lot better, but we simply cannot get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and then when, when there's, when there's a central planning of a money system, what's happened in Canada, as in many parts of the world is that the real estate prices have gone up so much because what people see, you get the malinvestment and the misallocation of capital of capital, because what people see is 
they unconsciously feel, oh, the value of my dollar is going down. Don't know why. The, the dollar price of this real estate thing is going up. Oh, okay. I conclude I must get some of this real estate stuff. Even though they have no more need for housing themselves, this is a defensive mechanism to stop the loss of their purchasing power, which Max is why our business exists. And it exists, I've, I've said this repeatedly, it exists for all the wrong reasons. We are a second order effect of a broken monetary system is why our business exists. I love that we're helping people and sharing these concepts, but really if I'm being completely fair and honest, we're rock star, our business should not be here. We should not be in the business of, well, no, I, I take that back. There is a utility value. If some people need some rental properties, you're going to university and there's some student housing and some, those are typically rentals. There is some need, but the, 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 the beyond the utility value, the monetization value of the real estate, that's all just excess and a misallocation of capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or economists would say, you know, uh, without the, the money printing and government intervention, a, a business like you would, would have less, uh, would, would be there to a lesser scale, uh, or a smaller scale or a lesser That's scale. That's fair. Yes, yeah, before, abs right? absolutely. So th there's still value in what you do, sure. obviously. Yeah. Thank but you. Okay. Phew. Thanks, Max. Okay. All right. Well, okay. We're still here. We're still here. We're on. We're on. <laughs> it's just, you know, you probably wouldn't need to have a firm with hundreds of employees. Yes. But, you know, yeah, just a yeah. couple of people would, would have been fine and, and not 10 firms or 100 firms like this in, in your city, but, but a couple. And so that, that, that's the unfortunate thing. There's opportunity cost, right? The broken window fallacy. Like, like sure, yeah, we, we can like, you know, bust a bunch of windows and then great, the, 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 you know, carpenter has a new job because he needs to make a new window. That's awesome. Um, uh, but no, uh, it, it's actually the other way around. If uh, the person who owns the window, uh, who now has to replace it because it is broken, he had a bunch of capital available, you know, to go hang out with his daughter and uh, go in the park, etc. But now instead of that, he has to do something that, that he didn't want to do, fix a, a window that wasn't broken before. And so... Yes, uh, we get a lot of great work for people like you in uh, you know running a, a, a big and valuable firm, but all of that energy that you put into this into this company, this project could have been applied into something that's even better than for this. the community, for society, for all of us, for you. Maybe there's an effect that we do here that benefits Max where you are. Like it's it's just so obvious yeah. that it's just all a congestion of illogical moves it's just it, it bothered me sorry now i'm getting frustrated um <laughs> but uh so so max um i where do you think this i, I want to ask you about the books that somebody could dive into and specifically the last book you mentioned to me when we were chatting because now i bought it and have it but i haven't read it yet but i'm because of you i'm going to read it but I feel like I have to buckle up for this book. Mm -hmm. um, but so where does this lead us? The, the current system that we're in, if it just continues to feed back incorrect ec economic data, it, it just, in, is it inevitable? It just like kind of slowly rots away? Um, it, yes, it, it slowly rots away, but with some booms and busts. Sometimes it rots faster than at other times. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I feel so, like we're at a faster time. I feel like we're at a faster time. <laughs> Currently, it's rotting pretty quick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but yeah, it, it can get worse and, and it will get worse, unfortunately, um, uh, because there, there are real serious economic consequences to human action. Right? When, when we act in a certain way, there are consequences. And after the act, the consequences cannot be escaped. Right? Um, and um, the, the same is true, not just for the individual, but for the macro economy. And again, like we've, we've printed money, which leads to malinvestments and overconsumption. So, so what's malinvestment, for example, right? We have um, raw materials, right? Natural resources, uh, let's say iron ore, right? Um, just a bunch of soil and ground that if you filter it correctly, you get pure iron, right? But now we have to filter it, right? We, so that's, that's where we have to apply capital, time, machines, fuel, energy, all of this to get the, the ore uh, or the soil to the ore to, uh, you know, the actual refined steel, for example. Um, and all of this is further production stages that were done. And as we are, for example, consuming the fuel for, you know, the, the machine that digs the dirt out, that fuel is now gone and we cannot use it for another purpose. Right? And so uh, we have applied uh, some yeah, gen uh, generic capital um, uh, for refining something. Right? And then, and now, now we have the steel which is a very generic good, right? We can do lots of different things with steel. 
uh, railroads, uh, wheels, airplanes, whatever, right? Lots of different things. But but ultimately, we choose to make one of them. Let's say we put this raw steel bar into an engine. And right? now we have a very specifically formed piece of machinery that contains mainly steel, yes, but it's shaped in a specific form. Maybe we added certain other um, uh, metals for to make alloys and such. Uh, so ultimately, we've we've took this very specific, uh, this very generic part of capital, and turned it to be very specific. And right? it's no longer this generous purpose steel; it's now an engine. And we've we've applied a lot of effort and work uh, in in order to transform the the production stage of of this thing. Right? It's now much more closer to be ready to uh, to be consumed um, for specifically, I guess, um, movement in in this case. Um, but the problem now is that we cannot easily go back, right? Uh, to to get the uh, the engine and dismantle it into all the different alloys or or, or parts of metal uh, that that is there is is again a, a substantial effort. Uh, but the problem is that in the past, right, with with all of the money printing, we have mal invested our resources, meaning we have applied more generic capital to be more specific in rather unnecessary roundabout production stages mm. for for uh, you know so roundaboutness of production stages basically means that there would have been a rather easy way to get a quick fix you know um like for example it's very simple to produce washing powder for your dishwasher by yourself right it's it's like two or three ingredients you mix it, mix it together it's just powder you toss it in done right super simple to do but then now you know we're all rich because money printer. So, hey, let's make this new business that creates these little tabs, you know, with three different liquids <laughs> that, that are all different colors. And then we wrap them individually and, you know, put another piece of wrapper and, and a ribbon. And, and then we place each individually in the box, et cetera, right? Like a very roundabout way to produce just soap, right? And, and sure, it's fancy looking soap and, and, you know, you can easily maneuver it and stuff, but it's still just soap. But it was like 100 times more expensive to build with a lot more machinery required and, and specific machinery required to produce something that is just soap. Right? So we increase the roundaboutness of production stages uh, and we dump a bunch of general cap capital to be more specific and lock it up into certain periods uh, or certain production areas. And, and so basically this means we just take all of our capital, all of our wealth Jeez. and we lock it up. Right? We, we take all the potential where, that we could have done with this stuff and we, we realize that potential, right? We call the option, we, like, we, we make the withdrawal, right? And, and we build yet another skyscraper in downtown. Um, and, and well, now all of this is done, right? We have the skyscrapers in downtown now. And the, the problem is though, like people are pretty hungry, right? Like mm -hmm. people are like starving in fact. And um, maybe we should not have done yet another office building in downtown. Like maybe we should have done a, a warehouse, you know, for, for corn or, or maybe another farm. Um, so th this is ultimately the boom period when, uh, or sorry, the, the bust period, right? The boom period is when, when we apply all of our extra capital into these roundable production stages. But, but sooner or later we realize that, oh shit, we don't have the capital anymore to finish the projects that we started. And yet the, the, the yet other skyscraper that, that we're currently building, sorry, like we're out of steel, um, we, we cannot continue building it. And, and now we have a problem because we have a half finished machine. And a half finished machine means it's not finished. It cannot produce anything yet. It's, it's to, to that extent completely valueless because you cannot use it in producing the consumer goods that you ultimately want. Um, but then, you know, still, uh, the the, uh, the capital has been specialized uh, and getting it out of there is very difficult, very expensive. I mean, you know that most modern buildings, you cannot even renovate them in, into their separate materials anymore because you spray foam and plastics everywhere that basically makes them in, inseparable. So getting the actual raw materials out of these production stages that we started to build is going to be very expensive or, or very difficult. Um, and because we started so many projects all at once, uh, like we we don't have any resources to finish any one of them if we would have started just a few projects we could have had the capital and the, the actual natural resources to finish those one or two buildings but because all of us thought that we're rich you know we started 20 houses and and none of these will will be finalized and like we're just now at this point where we're starting to realize that we're not as rich as we thought um and and that we probably borrowed quite a lot from from our future selves and well, that, that now the future is actually here, where we realize that we're we're quite hungry, but unfortunately, all of the 
the resources that we need to produce more food have have been mismanaged and applied to other parts of the economy where we cannot simply get them out anymore. You articulate that so clearly that it, it actually scares me a little bit. And that, cause in, in that example too, that I'm flashing back to the knowledge we're losing because not only are we not investing in the farms in that example that you just used, but the knowledge of some of the elders in that farm on how to grow the crops and how to manage the animals and how to manage the seasons and manage that land. We lose that knowledge or I, I, I can see that we've lost that knowledge again. I'm gonna go back to my family in Croatia and the village there. I saw my family handling animals and handling food and that knowledge with some things, the way they made us a prosciutto, the, the, the certain way and salted it a certain way. Those people in that village are now gone. They're gone. Mm -hmm. Those villages are deserted. If you go 30 minutes inland from the coast of the Adriatic into Croatia, there's deserted village after deserted village. You can see the, re the, the remnants. You could see the villages collapsing like physically. But to me, that's a representation of the knowledge that is also collapsing there. The opportunity cost of growing some things that we could be growing there. And then that knowledge is, is, is now gone. Like if, if you don't know how to salt the prosciutto anymore, that knowledge now is gone because we were building a... Uh, you know, a five-star hotel on the coast. Yeah. yeah. And that, that to me is, uh, that's just, it, it just sucks. Anyway, sorry, Max. <laughs> sorry. I, I, yeah, just... I, to I totally feel you. Like the, the downside of being an economist is that you tend to be rather depressed about the current <laughs> state of the world. It's pretty fucking bad. <laughs> I walk around telling everyone, listen, you hear me talking like this. I swear to God, I'm a positive person. I'm optimistic about the future. I swear to God. Okay. But you got to understand things suck right now. <laughs> oh yeah. shit. So I feel for you. I feel for you, Max. So thank you. You thank you for everything you're doing. Um so so like so then what did um I wanna I, I'm gonna come back to the five books you recommend because I really want to get those on the record. But then what does me stumbling into Bitcoin was this great hope because I thought, oh my gosh, here is something, a form of money that cannot be manipulated that to me gives me hope because I thought, oh, people can save again. And if they save, they can value their futures. And if they can save and think they have some value in the future, maybe they'll focus on doing something that they really have passion about or they really have a unique skill about and will serve us. And it, it, all these things started clicking for me, not just the, the fact that I could save, <laughs> like something so simple. Simple, right but it just gave me an extrapolation of people then saving and then how that morphs our future to a better future and that's what i really like about you know, one of the many things quite frankly that i liked about bitcoin when i first kind of stumbled into it when you stumbled into bitcoin what did it represent to you was it an answer to something in austrian economics that didn't exist or how do you view bitcoin yeah i, I was at this point where I, I got really far down the Austrian rabbit hole before really thinking about Bitcoin. Uh, and, and so I was a natural gold bug, basically, but then you know, also like young and from the digital age. So it, it was quite obvious that gold doesn't work on the computer, um, um, you know, because well, it, it literally you can't doesn't, stuff it in the USB drive. It, it doesn't, doesn't go, go through. USB. <laughs> no USB-C adapter for the gold. <laughs> um, and, and then realizing that the only way to get you know, gold in cyberspace was via a bank, a money warehouse. You know, you have to give someone else to the physical gold. And and then, I mean, money warehouses are cool and all. I have nothing fundamentally against them, but it's just not base money, right? I, I was really interested in base money as, as a concept uh, with base money basically being a, a, a final good for final settlement that is not a claim on something else by someone else, right? Um, the gold coin is is just a thing, right? But a piece of paper that says, whoever has this piece of paper can get a gold coin from my money warehouse, right? That piece of paper is a very different thing than the actual gold that it represents. Um, so base money in cyberspace was simply impossible with gold because well, a gold or any other metal is, is not in cyberspace, right? It's, it's meat space, it's, it's physical. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's, that made me quite depressed because then also you realize that gold in money warehouses is susceptible to huge amounts of manipulations by governments as, as we've seen throughout the last uh, century. Uh, so it, it doesn't seem to be a technological stack that, that works for, for humanity to securely manifest the monetary system that, that, that works for everyone. Um, and, and so that again, is the problem where you understand economics and how fucked up the world is, but see no real chance of fixing it. It yeah, really yeah. is depressing. Like it it's, is it's really bad. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
But, I've hung out with you, Max, a little bit. So I, anyone listening, I know Max is a smiling, positive guy. Just for for <laughs> for anyone questioning that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but the reason why I'm smiling and positive again is because of Bitcoin. Um, or or maybe more general that the cyberpunk ethos uh, of hey we can just write code, you know, and and write code uh, that embodies systems and principles that that carry the ethos and the value that that free individuals uh, w- would like to see in the world. Um, uh, you know, we we can just build the stuff ourselves and and run it ourselves. And then voila, we have systems of of control and, and strategy and, and technique that that can be applied and delivered to billions of people on this planet within basically a second right so um cypherpunk is, is is this is this crazy crazy idea of, of of almost hacking the matrix in in a way that that we simply can can use real logic and and like strong arguments so to say to ensure that productive people can continue to be productive and that the cost of interfering with the productive people uh, becomes greater and greater and greater, mm. uh, which which will ultimately mean that the parasites have no chance. And right? if if we can build systems where the productive people are protected from parasitisms, then they they will continue building and building and building, and we will get so insanely rich that it's it's not even funny. Um, uh, and that is that already happened with let's say strong encryption, right? If if two people want to speak in private about a business deal and and settle you know their contract they can do so while encrypting the communication about this contract so that only the two parties will will ever know about the the you know the details of 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 this contract that is reality now like we do it every day nowadays um and and that enables simply that we can communicate about so many things and and you just see the insane boom that the internet provided for commerce right for just two people meeting and exchanging valuable things for each other and and saying thank you very much and and walking their own ways this is now such a common occurrence not just for people who live in the same village but even for people on the other sides of the planet which is like insane you know how can we create value when when the other person is on the other side of the planet but still magically somewhere value appears and we're all happy it's it's like a miracle um but but this is possible thanks to encryption and and peer-to-peer uh, networking uh and and you know all types of, of things that that the cypherpunks have given us and and the final nail in, in the coffin so to say on on this uh cypherpunk performance art of that is the, the freedom of cyberspace uh, is bitcoin uh, all of a sudden we have base money in cyberspace like holy shit a thing that isn't defined by any single person or entity and and a thing that cannot simply be changed or redefined or 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 just taken away uh, it, it it's just a thing that is there and you can exchange it with others and if you have it nobody else has and you're the only one that can control where it goes next like it's it's absolutely wild and it sounds just like this weird magic stupid rock in in cyberspace and and yeah to a large extent it really is just a stupid rock in cyberspace but what we can do with a stupid rock in cyberspace is absolutely insane um <laughs> because again like anything can be money fundamentally as, as long as we all really want to have it uh, because other people want to have it and and such and uh, bitcoin fulfills so many of of the characteristics of a high quality money monetary unit that more and more people are waking up to the fact that you're really really stupid for using bad money especially when the good money is available and and the opportunity cost for, for switching are tiny like you can dump your fiat and, and simply use Bitcoin quite easily nowadays, uh, regardless of where you are, regardless what business you're in, um, regardless what, what savings you have, if it's much or little. Uh, and and that, is, that is fantastic. We finally have the opportunity for entrepreneurs and productive people to simply leave and say, hey, your monetary system that is designed to, to steal from me and, and make me steal from everyone else, I simply don't want this anymore. These, these negative influences and on, on my mindset and on my life, I, I would like to have a, a, a peaceful and productive existence. Thank you very much. You do you, I do me. Uh, I'll just use Bitcoin over there now. And voila, that's it. You're you're basically a free man and, and you have the ability to be productive again and to actually yeah. see that you are productive. And you 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 get to experience the, the of what it actually means to not steal from other people all the time. 
um, it it might sound quite stupid, but like it's it's no, a really it sounds it's, brilliant. it's a really great. It feeling. sounds brilliant. It's so simple that it's brilliant. Like yeah. it's it's brilliant. It's freeing. It's it's uh, yeah. It's incredible. Like uh, sometimes I just wake up. This is going to sound silly. Just thanking, like uh, like so thankful that it exists. Yeah. From your Max, from your understanding of history and economics, does does a, a good I don't know if you you know like Bitcoin in an economy does it become inevitable that it becomes the money of our world, or are there enough threats that it's not inevitable? Because sometimes I think of this, I think okay, my understanding of history would tell me that humans generally pick the most saleable good as money, you know, and kind of outline it with all the different characteristics that we would. And in that case, more and more people are waking up to Bitcoin. So it's just inevitable that this thing is going to take off. Am I being just too simple here? Are the threats too great that that's just, uh, I, sh I shouldn't conclude that? Well, I, one of the foundational uh, axioms of, of praxeology in Austrian economics is that the future is uncertain. Right? We we simply don't don't know a lot of things about the future, um, and and there's multiple things like you know um, th there there might be uh, you know a solar flare you know hitting all types of electronic hardware. So let's say there are acts of nature that that can change the arena substantially. Um, but but then not just that. There's also the way that humans behave is is fundamentally unpredictable, right? We uh, like could happen that tomorrow the Fed simply closes down and says, oh, "No, no, okay, it's good. We have free market competition now for for money. Uh, anyone can print dollars in whatever shape or form. Just do it. We'll figure it out." Like I'm not sure if Bitcoin would would still um, survive in in such like <laughs> if it would have okay, a, a perfect yeah, yeah. private property private private property rights society like we we could probably just have banknotes uh, uh, like we might not even need base money for for the entire world let's say mm -hmm. um it 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 is it, still pretty likely that bitcoin is going to going to be a thing for the long run um but yeah i'm i i wouldn't say that it's certain yeah the future um, is not known is not certain yeah yeah Okay. Um, Max, can you, I, I want to ask you a couple more questions about Bitcoin, some of the, the threats that you would see as today, because I think some people are going to be interested in that. But before we get to that, can you outline just the books that if someone wanted to drive into Austrian economics that you outlined for, for me previously, could you just outline them? Yeah. So there are five books that I, I think are a good, a good all round, um, well, journey throughout economics. Uh, they, they might be a bit tough, um, some of them, but they they are, I think, worth it. Um, and they they start more on, uh, or the, the order is more in in, not necessarily the way that you should read it, but but more the 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 theoretical foundations, right? So so first uh, is theory and history by by Ludwig von Mises, which is one of his more theoretical uh, pieces, um, uh, where he line, lays out the way to think about economics. And right? so he clearly differentiates economics from physics, for example, uh, that, you know, thinking about how does a rock fall when I throw it is very different to how will humans engage in, in, in trade. And that uh, humans and rocks are, are quite different simply because humans act and rocks don't. Um, uh, so th this methodological dualism is, is described in, in this book. And then he lays out the, the action axiom uh, from from which he argues we can deduce economics, right? So a, a um, value-free descriptive science of what are the consequences of human actions, right? Like what happens when we increase the money supply? Uh, what happens when we, um, yeah, when, when we fix prices or, or when we set interest rates uh, below the market standard, etc.? We can have logically correct answers to these statements uh, of, of clearly describing what the consequences of these actions are. Um, and, and so this is nicely laid out in, in theory and history. Um, a, a second book uh, that a, a bit later, but probably even more bombastic, uh, is from Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, The Economic Science and the Austrian Method. Uh, here, he is, it's again, a very theoretical work, uh, and he introduces uh, the axiom of uh, uh, um, argumentation. And so that, that humans, uh, can argue and and they can discover truth, right? And and we understand logic and we can make true and and false statements. Um, and w with this axiom, we can actually deduce not just economics but even ethics. And right? so this is somewhere where, where Mises would would not go, but but Hoppe does. Is we can make statements of what humans should not do, right? Uh, humans should not steal. 
full stop. There, there is no excuse for it. There's no justification for it. Don't steal. Right? It does not matter when, where, or how. Um, and, and that is a, a objective statement that we can make thanks to Hoppe's argumentation. And it's, it's basically, I think, since, since Plato or Socrates, um, you cannot derive an ought from an is. Um, but Hoppe proves that, no, in fact, we can. Uh, and, and theft is the one dividing line. That's why it's so, so geniusly simple. Right. Or, or that's why it feels so geniusly simple. It's it's so obvious. And, and Hoppe actually provides a, a extremely rigorous logical proof, you know, um, uh, that goes very deep in, in, into philosophy and, and epistemology. So, um, yeah, d tough to read, but, but fantastic when, when you actually understand the, the magnitude of, of, of this concept. And the third book. Yeah. Then um, next uh, we have the real economic treatise, and that is Man, Economy and State with Power in Markets by Murray Rothbard. Uh, this is an economic treatise. So he starts from the very beginning, you know, meaning epistemology, the, the history of thought and, and how should we think about economics, etc. Uh, and, and then lays out uh, the, the action axiom and time preference, interest rates, uh, you know, like individual actions, um, as, as well as then uh, two people interacting, uh, you know, so trade, uh, money, interest rates, credit, all of this are, is, is being discussed as well then a theory or a study of, um, let's say the interventionism, right? So, uh, uh of, of theft, how exactly can theft be laid out? And, and there are three forms of theft. Uh, there's, um, uh, uh, there's autistic intervention, meaning I tell you, you're not allowed to drink this beer, right? Prohibition. Uh, I tell you what not to do with your body and your own goods and services. Then, then we have the binary intervention, um, where I say, "Hey, I, give me your money. Right? Your money goes to my, it goes into my pocket." Uh, that is, is two people in, or one person intervening with, with the goods of service of another for his own benefit. Uh, and then finally, we have triangular intervention. And right? so I'm saying that uh, you, uh, you know, Tom and Peter, you two are not allowed to to make this trade. Um, so one person meddling with the business of of two other people. Those are the three fundamental ways that people can steal from each other. And, and unfortunately, it happens all the time, especially by governments. Um, and, and yeah, that, that leads to uh, yeah, quite dire consequences. So man, economy and state, especially power and markets, the, the final part, uh, a f phenomenal book on, on anarcho-capitalist thought. Um, then another one interesting for, for money uh, specifically by Jörg Guido Hiltzmann is The Ethics of Money Production a beautiful book about the, the details of monetary theory in the praxeological Austrian tradition. Um, and then even with a little teaser on, uh, on Bitcoin, you know, because it, it talks about in, in just half a page, you know, one or two paragraphs on how a digital base money has never been seen in humanity and that it is very unlikely to ever be discovered written in 2007, right? Wow. So just before Bitcoin <laughs> came out, um, wow. uh, he, like Hulsman was, was aware of how incredibly unlikely and, and sheer impossible it is that we could come up with a digital base money. Um, but he, he didn't rule it out completely. He just said it's very, very unlikely. And he was super right with that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess Satoshi said, hold my beer. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try. <laughs> yeah, the future is unknown as we discussed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wow. Um, and the fifth so book, would it, that would be cyber economics? Uh, the, the fifth book, then crypto economics. Crypto, um, sorry, fundamental crypto. Principles by, uh, of Bitcoin uh, by Eric Voskuehl. This is, is a fundamentally amazing book. Um, uh, for one, because it actually explains Bitcoin on it, better than any other explanation of Bitcoin. Like in, in very precise definitions and really... Well, clear and, and short articulations of extremely complex uh, concepts in Bitcoin. Um, but then also it, it doesn't just address Bitcoin. It, it introduces an axiom uh, of, of resistance, which I think is required in order to talk about strategic uh, freedom technologies, right? Like, uh, it, you know, so I guess maybe to frame it this way, that there are three, basically three axioms in praxeological thought. We started with human action um, and, and Mises was very particular that we can only deduce economic consequences. We cannot deduce value judgments of this action is better than the other. Right? We don't have logical proofs for that until later Hoppe introduced the, the argumentation axiom where we did, in fact, introduce proofs on 
um, you know, uh, yeah, this, these actions should not be done by humans, full, full stop, right? But, but still, we didn't really have a, a, a clear plan for strategy. Like, how do we actually, um, how, how do we actually apply our, liber like our libertarian thought and, and live a freer life? Um, and I think that's like, at least for me personally, in my mind, this, this totally got, got enabled by introducing the axiom of resistance, meaning saying that no technology, no security whatsoever can protect you unless you resist. And you can have a great gun and a massive, like three feet thick safe where you store all of your gold. But then, you know, the bad guy comes and says, hey, open your door. I want all of your gold. And you're like, sure, buddy, here's the key. Go in. Right? You, you do not resist him. The safe, the gun, the booby traps, nothing will help you. Right? They, he will just get the gold. So resistance is essentially important for a strategy of, of liberation in, in the long run. And it is essentially important to understand Bitcoin. Um, uh, you know, one of the most common feedbacks that you get when talking to people about Bitcoin is, oh, well, yeah, the government is just going to ban it. Mm -hmm. well, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And yeah. First of all, yes, they will. <laughs> and, and second of all, that doesn't matter because we assume that the people who want to use sound money will want to use it at the expense of being called, you know, a, a, a terrorist, basically, mm -hmm. and being said that, no, this is this is illegal and you cannot use it. Yeah. Okay. They're psychopath, psychopaths. Yeah. There are psychopaths out here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but the answer is, yeah, come and take it. Mm -hmm. It's a peaceful. So then Bitcoin represents a peaceful resistance. No? Um, or no? Yeah, I, I would say so. No, it, because it's also not politicking, right? Politicking would be, hey, let's, let's reform the Fed, right? Uh, or even let's end the Fed. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's change the political system. You know, we, we just need to get the right people in charge to turn the ship around. Um, and I, I think that it's been tried many times and not to great success. I'm not saying that it's impossible to reform the system from within, but at least it's very difficult to do so in a consistent manner um, in, in the long run. Um, I think starting a new system provides, well, at least different trade-offs, right? You can start from scratch and you can start with certain foundations from scratch that, that might be very beneficial to have. On the other hand, you know, designing a complete new system is very complex and there is going to be a lot of unknown unknowns as well. So I'm not saying that that either of these systems is clearly better, but Bitcoin is obviously in the second camp, right? We're not trying to reform central banking. We're simply saying, no, like, let's, let's create a system without central banks. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then people can use it. And if people like it, well, they're going to use it. And if they like it more than the central bank system, then yeah, fewer and fewer people will, will use the central banking system and more and more people will use a, a you know, much more consensual system. And, and the beautiful thing is that, uh, you know, any fiat currency was basically introduced via coercion, right? Nixon went on television and said, yep, uh, your promise to get gold based on the piece of paper, that's, that's gone, but you can keep the piece of paper. It's mm -hmm. fine. It's temporarily <laughs> gone. It's temporarily gone, Max. <laughs> temporarily gone. Yeah. 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 For, for many years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Max, I, 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 yeah, I just love talking to you. You give me a lot to think about. Uh, do you have a, I just want to wrap up with a couple more minutes. Do you have a couple more minutes or sure. how are we for, yes. Okay. Um, so what, do, what to you right now, uh, before I ask you what you're working, just kind of working on so people can understand and follow your, your work and what you're doing, what do you look at as one of the most positive things about Bitcoin that really excites you for the future? And what is one of the things that scares you that is maybe a threat or that is uh, unsolved at the current time? Could you share one of each? Just, just what comes to mind? It could be random. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I guess the 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 people working in the industry is is one thing that 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 really yeah that I really appreciate, and and I guess specifically the character change that they have experienced from before discovering Bitcoin to to now, you know, oh, wow. years after encountering. It. Huh. Um, like, I'm I'm not sure w w which was the case that that just insanely high quality people get attracted to Bitcoin right away. And, you know, maybe that's true, but I guess it's more like a bunch of libertarians and, and et cetera got, got attracted to, uh, to Bitcoin right away. Um, but then I think also, you know, people who come for completely different reasons, uh, you know, just getting rich and, and trading and number go up, et cetera. Ultimately, after having been touched by this technology, they, they exhibit a, a incredible 
change of character like like unheard of right and and it's not just that this happened once like this happened like to tens of thousands of people that i've met uh by, by now and you know that like probably even like even more so the how bitcoin changes the individual is i think one of the most bullish bullish things um and, and yeah, I think this is because Bitcoin has a fundamental ethic imbued in its technology of you shall not steal. And when, when again, when we stop stealing from each other, you, you literally feel the difference. Like it's, it, it, it's yeah, it, it's very it's beautiful. It's almost, you, you feel like you don't have to take advantage. Not that anyone thinks you have to take advantage of the, the, the man or woman standing next to you in an economy, but somehow there's this unconscious thing of like, oh, I have to get ahead at the expense of you. Even if you don't want mm -hmm. to articulate those words, it's kind of this undercurrent to the way the current system has operated. But under a Bitcoin standard, when you start to internalize it, you realize, oh my gosh, I just have to produce value and express that value in the economy. And if I'm rewarded for that value, you, the, the value I get in return in a form of Bitcoin, I could save for my future. And it's very, it gives you such a peace of mind. It gives you this ability to think, I want the best for Max. I want the best for him. And what serves Max and how Max, if Max can operate to the best of his ability, it also serves me. And we can also kind of build together. And I got to tell you, there's a feeling when we were at that football match in England, I had been to a couple of Bitcoin conferences before, but there was something so cool, Max, about just hanging around a group of people on a Saturday afternoon, all having these discussions, everybody in a positive way. I, I really felt this like energy from that. This is going to sound silly, Max, but I just thought, how fortunate am I to be standing in this field in England somewhere? And there's Max walking by and I get to, I think me and Nick yelled at you like, Hey, good talk or something. And then we started <laughs> interacting with you. And then you just started discussing some of these economic principles. Um, and we were just there chatting and it was just to me that I, I can't express it in words, I guess. It was just incredible feeling. Like I just, I just felt like, wow, this is where I want to be. This doesn't feel like the conferences I went to in Las Vegas in my software sales days. You, you know what I mean? Like this just felt like real, like this is the, you know, and then Jeff Booth walking by and Preston's there. Jack Mahler's is there. Other people I had met at the conference with some names of people, people won't uh, recognize, but just incredibly beautiful people doing their thing. It was just wild. So I had never thought about it that way. Um, so sorry, I kind of maybe hijacked what you said there, uh, Max, <laughs> but yeah, but beautiful. And, um, and, and then I guess to, to the negative aspect of it, um, I fear that this can get lost as well uh, and, and forgotten right? by, um, by, I guess, people not, not caring about the 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 fundamentals that enable this technology and that enable technologies other than that um you know people simply not i, I guess not caring to be free uh, not uh, people being fine with slavery uh, in 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 other words you know this this is something that is similar to you know huxley or, or orwell um you know that people can be tricked to being totally fine with with not being free anymore as as long as there are certain goodies or, or benefits that that are there and you know that that sucks like that's mm. uh, and and i hope that that we won't get there with bitcoin either you know that hey look here's your 50 bucks worth of of stimulus check for the new cbdc etc um or yeah you can have bitcoin in etfs but but you know don't self custody it and especially not privately right like we clearly want to know how many sats you have <laughs> um like uh, if if these if if these aspects are are continued to to be normalized and and treasured by individuals then um, yeah, well, the axiom of resistance is gone, right? Uh, and and without this axiom of, of resistance, and without people actually standing up for for their freedoms, uh, Bitcoin simply has no chance. It it cannot protect you uh, un unless we resist ultimately. Uh, and and so the the big question is: Will will enough people stand up and and say no? Uh, and you know, arguably during COVID, that was a pretty sobering experience. Of most people will not, um, uh, and uh, that. That hurts, you know. Um, but on the other hand, going back to the first point of what makes me so insanely bullish is that clearly, people uh, like Bitcoiners do care, like a lot, right? Uh, and and they do stand up and and uh, speak their their truth and and stand their ground. And that again, you know, it it balances out. I'm I'm very what do you call it? Almost schizophrenic in the sense mm -hmm. of extremely yeah. bullish and, and extremely bearish, yeah. and it flip flops uh, quite quite frequently, but. Yeah, the, the next couple of years will will be very insane and and quite intense and i think almost of a, a landmark in in terms of 
importance for for Bitcoin. I'm I'm not one one of those Bitcoiners who thinks that Bitcoin is certain to to be here and and you know we're done we're, we've won already. Mm -hmm. um, I I think that Bitcoin is still quite well a, a young experiment that that still is quite fragile and that can definitely be taken down if if we do not steward and and foster it uh, correctly. Um, Bitcoin is not that old of a technology. Uh, and uh, it's it's not that lindy, so to say, uh, so, and and we still need to ensure that it doesn't go down the shitter, um, because that that would be the most depressing thing, you know. When when we w we had this miracle in in our hands, and and then we dropped the ball and and we fumbled it. Uh, I, I guess that's that's the biggest fear that I have that that our generation is the one that that fucked up Bitcoin. Uh, like, how are you going to explain that to your grandkids? You know. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're you're around, and you know, yeah. So, Max, uh, what are you working on? What if, if people want to follow you? What are you working on right now? What are you What do you do day to day that occupies your time? Could you just share that as we as we come to conclusion here? Yeah, but basically at the forefront of monetary computer science, <laughs> how I like to say it. Um, uh, so, um, I, I like to, I still love to think about economics and 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 especially monetary theory. So that does take up a decent amount of, of my time, uh, so to say. And, Are and you then, teaching this right now? No. Um, uh, I guess to friends who ask. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> you, you're able to articulate the concept so clearly, it just feels like a natural role for you. So, got it. Yeah. Um, no, I've, I've, I've done probably thousands of, of videos online uh, by now on, on economics and tech. Mm -hmm. So, th th that type of teaching is uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, also trying to, to apply it. I guess thinking about just what... How could we engineer a perfect money? You know, this this type of question is is just very, well, it's a very tough one. Um, and I guess I've narrowed it down to Bitcoin as as the one tech with a decent amount of chance to to be able to make that. Uh, and and then Bitcoin is near perfect. You know, there's not many things that that can be better uh, or that that we could design to be better. But fundamentally, you know, scalability and privacy are are those two. The, the very two obvious co uh, concerns of, of a system like Bitcoin um, and, you know, working on, on making these things easier and better. Uh, so I'm a big fan and, and early user of the Lightning Network, for example, um, as, as a good way of, of making more transactions without every full node having to verify every transaction of everyone else. Um, so, so uh, yeah, Lightning Network research is very interesting, but but also other second layer technologies, um, RGB, for example, or, or state chains, um, you know, hedgehog channels or or potentially even zero knowledge proofs um, and, and CK rollups. There, there's quite a lot of research on on transactional scalability for, for a system like Bitcoin. Um, so so keeping up with that is, is is quite interesting. And and then also how to improve the privacy. Um, and, and usually those two are, are actually quite closely related. Uh, but privacy obviously is important for a monetary system as, as it is related to fungibility. And if, if everyone knows exactly the transaction history of, of any coin, so to say, then two coins are no longer indistinguishable. Right? There's a clear difference. Hmm. That's the coin that you got from your mom and that's the coin that you got from your uncle, let's say. Um, and and uh, if, if you know a difference, then you have a, a different subjective value to those. And if, if other peoples recognize a difference in these as well, then they will also have different differentiating values for, for these coins. And ultimately, that ruins a huge positive aspect of money uh, in the sense that it is fungible and, and you don't need to mentally account for the differences of the coins. And you, they are simply all the same and you can trade them indistinguishably. Uh, but if we, if we reintroduce um, you know, non-fungibility, non-privacy in, into the money system, then uh, calculation becomes a lot more difficult uh, because now different units of money have different prices, etc. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, those are the two things that I think need to be fixed about Bitcoin and, um, yeah, uh, those, I, I try to, to at least contribute in, uh, getting it towards the right direction. It gives me great peace and joy to hear that someone like you is working and thinking on these things. Max, th like, thank you. Like, seriously, I, 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 I'm not trying to say this lightly, like really thank you for the contributions you're making to it for all, all of us. I, I don't know how to express that more deeply. Like I really, really thank you. I appreciate Thanks, Tom, I appreciate it. Yeah, like you're like I just think for my children when the, the stuff that you're doing is so, so critically important to all of us. So uh, where would uh, where do you, would you like people to go to just I don't know if they want to follow more about you or support you in some capacities or just your website or somewhere they could go or you could direct them or no. 
Yeah, towards liberty.com, um, a small little website uh, I, I put together, uh, which also has in, in, in the archive some book recommendations, not just the five that I mentioned, but uh, probably a couple of hundreds. I, wanted... I was going to say hundreds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I think um, separated into um, Bitcoin uh, economics and natural law. Uh, so the, the third one, you know, anarchist uh, philosophy and, and thought, I, I find extremely fascinating as well. Um, so yeah, lots of book recommendations there. And um, yeah, that's that's basically it. So uh, yeah, towards, so towards liberty.com, towards liberty.com. And we'll put a link in the show notes to anyone driving and listening to this. If you want to get there, we'll, we'll put that there. Cool. Um, Max, um, thank you. And and as as you kind of we wrap here, so who who is Satoshi? <laughs> um, uh, so first of all, thanks Tom for for the invite. I, I really appreciated this convo. And and yeah, um, who is Satoshi? I mean, who knows? And I, I actually find it quite fascinating that that this is such a such a common topic to discuss because <laughs> clearly the guy doesn't want us to know. <laughs> <laughs> If someone just he cannot say leave me the fuck alone <laughs> clearly enough you know <laughs> so um yeah. oh, I, I don't want to speculate on who satoshi yeah. is you know I'm, I'm extremely like insanely thankful for him you know like oh. like just how you appreciate it like or, or you expressed your gratitude yeah. towards me looks like I, I did jack shit like I, I didn't do much right but but satoshi i mean come on like yes. we really have to be like a, a decent amount of gratitude yes. and, and thanks is in order because yeah. he he probably saved the entire human species. So thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All, all he's asking is leave me alone. Yeah. Yeah. And none of us will. Yeah. 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 Oh boy. All right, Max. Thank you. This is an absolute pleasure. Uh, you know, really appreciate this, Max. Thank you very much. Likewise, Tom. And see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms. Your life, your terms.